And now I have a word for you who brashly announced today, at the latest, tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for the year. We're going to start a business and make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills it and we're still alive, we'll do this or that. As it is, you are full of your grandiose selves. All such vaunting self-importance is evil. In fact, if you know the right thing to do and don't do it, that for you is evil. And to find a word to you arrogant rich, take some lessons in lament. You'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you've piled up is judgment. All the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter-than-usual corpse. One day, a rich but miserly man came to a wise rabbi. The rabbi led him to the window and said, look out and tell me what you see. I see people, the rich man answered. And then the rabbi led him to a mirror. What do you see now? I see myself, he replied. And the rabbi said, behold, in the window there is glass, and in the mirror there is glass. But the glass of the mirror is covered with a little silver, and no sooner is a little silver added than you cease to see others and see only yourself. I want to talk today about what um, I like to call the green god, the green god. Call it that because it has such power in our lives, power to shrivel our souls and shut off this switch of compassion that God has put into each and every one of us. Um, Today is Palm Sunday. It's a day when we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem the week prior to his crucifixion and then ultimately his resurrection. Um, What we need to know is that when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he struggled mightily with what was going on in the church there, in the temple of the time. He was very angry because the church had become a very money-centered place. Remember how he overturned all of the money changers' tables? It was an act of defiance and symbolic of how uh, that can overtake any person or any institution if we let it. Uh, Jesus taught a lot about what we have and what we own and what we get. James, who wrote a letter to Christians everywhere long after the death of Jesus, he had the same worries too. And and we we have read about it in the book of James. If you've been reading, you would know. Um, He was very worried in the first and second chapter about favoritism that we show toward people who have means and who have wealth. We all like to attach ourselves to people who have wealth. It's all easier to be more uh, favorable to them than it is to people who have nothing. And James was very clear that we didn't want that life happening in the church. Um, So as he gets to the end now of his letter, he just comes back to this one more time, and he has a warning for us about, uh, about those of us who sort of spend our lives uh, thinking a little too much about this whole thing about money and about what it is for us. Um, And he warns very sternly about um, those who are getting their money on the backs of people who have very little. Um, And he says that'll wind up being a judgment for them. And so um, James has addressed several very clear kinds of things in the life of the church as we have gone through this letter. He has addressed um, division, he has addressed uh, conflict, Uh, he has addressed living with trials, 
All of those things are a normal part of life and a normal part of Christian life, so it's not really any surprise that by the time he got to the end, he would just give us this warning then uh, about our wealth and our possessions. And so I just want to make sure that we touch on that too um, in order to be faithful to James and what he's trying to say. Uh, The Bible teaches us a lot of things about this topic. Um, As I said, uh, have said, Jesus taught more about this Uh, than any other subject that he talked about. So, in fact, I was just in a small group uh, about a a week or 10 days ago uh, where uh, the group has just finished reading a 500-page book on heaven. On heaven. This is a good book, so it was great. But Jesus said 10 times more about how we ought to handle our life and our money and our possessions than he ever did about heaven. I don't know that most people know that. He said didn't say a lot about heaven. But we don't read very many 500-page books teaching us about the stewardship of our lives. So let's just say a few things uh, this morning that will help us on this matter and uh, give us a biblical perspective. And, and the first one is this, that the green God is deceptive. Deceptive uh, for a number of reasons. But the first one is that it offers the promise of independence when in reality it makes us very dependent. Uh, Money has a way of making us love it. Um, That's true, I'm sure. Uh, Well, first of all, it's true for me, and I'm sure it's true for a lot of us. I bet it's true for most of the men in here. It's just something about, you know, when when your wallet's full or you got something in your money clip, it just kind of feels good. And when you get more, it just kind of feels better. Uh, And it's really easy to get addicted to that feeling. Um, And and we go through life, and first it's the savings account, and then we get the CDs, and then we get the IRAs, and then we get the mutual funds, and then we get the stock portfolio, and then we get the college funds for the kids. And it's better than drugs. But our tolerance just keeps going up. Because it's almost like the more that we get, the more that we think we need. I make more money now than I did five years ago, and I made more then than I did five years before. I've been making more uh, most of my life. Uh, One would think that you would start to feel some uh, surge of satisfaction or confidence in the future uh, of of independence from worry about being destitute. Um, We all, we have enough to make it. Uh, We have a lot of things, so why are we not satisfied? Uh, Why do we not see the things we have but always keep seeing the things that we don't have and want and and we think we need and deserve? Now, that's not freedom. That's bondage. And and I've observed that bondage in people, regardless of their assets or their income. Money has a way and a power to make us love it and grow to depend on it in an unhealthy way. It's deceptive that way. Secondly, the green God is deceptive because it makes us think we will be better able to help others when in reality it can sever the nerve of compassion and generosity. You do know who the most generous people in the United States are, don't you? Those who are hovering just above the poverty line. Modestly poor people give more of their wealth to charitable causes as a percentage of their income than anyone else in this country. So it's always an interesting piece of math that I have to do with myself. I mean, is it is it is it harder for a person earning twenty thousand dollars a year to give two thousand away, or for a person earning two hundred thousand dollars a year to give twenty thousand away? The math says it's harder to live on the 18 left over than on the 180 left over. But the statistics tell us that upper class people in this country give less than two and a half percent of anything they have away. I was reading an article this week, I wish I could quote it, but I believe it said that more than 20 percent in this country don't give one dollar to any any cause throughout the course of a year. Um, I think that money can decrease compassion because it insulates us from the world. You know, we, 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 we want a nice home that is away from problem areas. I get that, right? We vacation in places where life is nice. We, 
It is easy to become ignorant and immune to the hurts of the world. But the people who live in that world, they see it. They hear the cries. They feel the pain of their neighbors and themselves. And so they have a different level of compassion. And and it's a small wonder that Jesus' ministry was done primarily with and for those people. Because they're the ones who have grown a heart that, that can respond to the hurts and needs of others. And sadly, the green God has iced the veins of many who are wealthy. Um, There was a story in a city, one of the hospitals was raising money for a desperately needed new wing. And uh, when the first phase of the gifts campaign was completed, the chairman discovered that the wealthiest person in the city had failed to make a pledge that the campaign had hoped for. So the chairman uh, called on the man at his business and he said, you know, our records show that you you have uh, not made your pledge yet to the new hospital wing. I'd like to stop by and pick up your commitment to the cause. And the businessman said, your records? He said, your records. He said, do your records show that my mother is destitute? Do your records show that my sister was abandoned with three small children to raise? Do your records show that my brother is totally disabled and unemployed? Well, taken aback, the, uh, the chairman said, well, no, I'm sorry. He said, our records don't show any of these dire needs that you have shared with me. And, and before he could say another word, the rich man said, well, if I don't do anything to help them, why should I help you? <laughs> Number three. The green God is deceptive because it offers the promise of security when in reality it protects almost nothing important to living well. Um, Security, power, popularity, prestige, controls, it offers all these things. It's security that we're most taken with. Um, We all think, you know, one day when we have enough, whatever the definition of enough is, then we just think we won't have to worry we will be impervious to life's crushing blows wherever they may be. But the last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether a family will stay together or not. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether there is alcoholism or addiction in a home. The last time I checked, money is no indicator whether there is physical abuse in a house. We would be appalled and ashamed if we knew what was happening in the best of neighborhoods around here. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether the children will love the parents in the home. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether a person will get cancer or Alzheimer's or have bypass surgery. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether a man or woman has honest and decent friends. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether a person will grow old or not. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether a body will have faith in the Lord or not. The last time I checked, money is no indicator of whether you will die or not. You will. To spend so much life chasing so hard after a God that can do so little in the things that matter is nothing short of a tragedy. Better to be a pauper in the house of Christ and know that his presence and guidance will be like a pillar in the midst of a turbulent journey through life. Now that we have some perspective on how deceptive that money can be, just want to say something now about how we overcome, how we overcome the green God in our lives. And the first way we do it is this. We overcome the green God by, number one, just realistically assessing our needs. Our needs. I say that because most of us don't really know what we need to live well. Uh, Many of us have been unrealistically duped by the advertisers into thinking we'll just not find any happiness or fulfillment unless we view the world through their eyes. I remember at a very young age reading uh, the book Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Has anybody ever read Thoreau's Walden? Look at that. Raise your hand up again. I just want to see. All right, the rest of you, get an education. 
But you know, the story is how he wanted to take a year and, and, and live as simply as humanly possible uh, without uh, distractions. And it's a marvelous book and kind of an indictment even in back uh, long, long ago on all the things that you need versus the thing that you want. But I, I just was remembering this week how Thoreau had kind of deduced the primary need was for the body to keep the vital heat. <laughs> the body to keep the vital heat. So there were actually cultures, he thought, where people, they slept, they didn't even have houses. They slept in like sleeping bags, like skins of, of animals, but that kept them warm. In fact, why do you eat? You eat to provide the body the vital heat. So for him, he had sort of reduced that. That is the primary need. Um, so, you know, uh, you have to think sometimes, do I need all the things that I have? Do I need, uh, uh, you know, this house, this car, this, 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 this? What do I really need versus what do I really want? And uh, that's a good exercise for us. Um, I just want to say, too, that um, uh, in, in some instances, people genuinely do not have enough for what they need. And those of us who do are, are here to help them. But um, I don't want to imply that people should feel guilty to think, I mean, everything about money isn't wrong. You shouldn't feel guilty for thinking about it or wanting it. But your needs, your needs, whether you're in wealth or you're in poverty, your needs, not just your wants, not just what television keeps telling you everybody has. Now, secondly, we overcome the green God when we take time to get in touch with our feelings about money. And I say that very intentionally, our feelings about money. One of the best things you could ever do is just sit down and write down your anxieties, fears, emotions that are attached to money in your life. I mean, you know, maybe a little autobiography. This is what I learned from my parents about, about money. Uh, this is what I'm afraid if I don't have enough. Well, this is the things I'm afraid of. And, and, and just, just talk about the things that you learned, that you're concerned about, that you're afraid of. It, it is an amazing thing to do that little exercise. I know that I've done that in my life two or three times. And it's like, so what it does is it brings up into your consciousness a whole bunch of things that don't have anything to do with money. They have to do with other things. Um, you know, some of us are just terrified that someone's going to find out that we're not as much of a success as, as, as we want them to think we are. Uh, some of us will find out that we're afraid others will think that we're too successful. Um, some people here grew up in hard times, and so we hoard and we're afraid, and we live this uh, attitude of scarcity. We remember when there wasn't enough to eat. And then we think to ourselves, oh, well, you know, we earn 25 times what the average citizen of Kenya does. We're really not on the brink of starvation here. And then when we write that down, we see how irrational that is. Sometimes money comes because it's the handmaiden of pride. Sometimes it's used to fill loneliness. Sometimes it's a drug to intoxicate us against the longings and hurts of an empty childhood. I knew a man once that I pastored. Um, he was very successful. He was just, he was, he was a workaholic. He was a workaholic to get moneyaholic. Over and over and over again. I discovered one day in a conversation with him that, that, that his dad was an alcoholic. And he had swore he was never going to be like his dad. And he wasn't. But he was. He just traded alcohol for work and money. And so once he sort of figured that out, it really wasn't about the work and the money at all. It was about an addiction. It was about living out a life in somehow rebellion to his father. So, you know, you get my point. It's just good sometimes to think about or write out what you're afraid of if you don't have enough money or, or, or what it is you worry about. 
And probably after that, you'll have some clear handle on why it is we're really driven the way that, that, that we are and the way that you are. And, and you'll probably see that often it's a substitute for a lot of things that you might be able to find elsewhere. Third, we overcome the green God when we don't make money one of our values, we make it work for our values. So often we say we believe in family and helping others and improving the community and strengthening God's mission of our church. But if someone to go look at your checking account, would it reveal that or would it reveal something different? So each of us would do well to look over our our credit card statements or our bank statements and just ask ourselves, are we investing our money in the things that are the highest value to us and that we say are the highest value? Are we investing in the things that lift lives? Are we investing in the things that glorify God? Are we investing in things that will live on for an eternity? When you die, I hope you will remember that you will be leaving behind the same amount as Donald Trump. All of it. You know, the Lord has all the money he needs up there. You don't have to worry about the Lord. So we will not impress him with however much or little we have. But friends, that's the good news. What impresses him is the way we use what he's given us, not the way it has used us. Fourth, we overcome the green God when we turn our money life over to Christ. There was a legend that when Emperor Constantine was uh, baptized, um, he wanted to get baptized to us submerged, but he wanted to keep his right arm out of the water because that's the arm that he would hold his sword in for battle. And uh, for a lot of us, if we were going to be baptized, we want to hold our arm out. We just want to hold our wallet out, right? (laughs) So we baptize everything but that. So a lot of us have made Christ the Lord of everything, but it's hard to make Christ the Lord of our pocketbooks. We want him to have control of everything. But of course we want to have control of ourselves. And if money is anything, it's control. I just want to say we can trust him. We can trust him. Anything Christ asks us to do has a purpose and a plan, and we can trust him. I am reminded again that this Palm Sunday is a celebration of the one who overturned the money changers' tables, and he was not received well for that. But he gave. He gave everything that he had. He gave all of that sacrifice for us. Nothing was more important to Christ than doing God's will. And and he lost everything that he had when they nailed him to the cross. Everything. But the story next weekend is that God raised him up and exalted him and set him at his right hand. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he will provide you with all these other things, in other words, all the necessary things. It takes faith to believe that. And it takes risk and it takes courage. But the reward, says the scriptures, is a crown and a treasure that will never fade and whose riches will not be counted at the end in dollars and cents but in love and in life. Jesus wants to remind us (laughs) that he gave everything. And the way that he wants to remind us is that when we get together He wants us to take a piece of bread and remember how his body was broken. And then he wants us to take the cup 
and remember how his blood was shed and to realize how completely he released himself into the will of God. The result being life. Life for us and life for him. And now we are to be his people in the world. We are the people of the body and the blood, of the bread and the cup. And he invites us to share with our world what he shared with us so that all might come to know him and live with him in exalted living and lives. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat in remembrance of me. Following supper, he took the cup and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from this all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this and remember me. And so we will. And we will be his people. Fed by his spirit. And fed by his love. Let us pray. And if the servers will come forward at this time. Mighty God, pour out your spirit on the bread and the cup that we will receive here today. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. In taking this sacrament, make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen.